This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 22nd, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I regularly join Michael on Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the university starts moving beyond the denial phase to acceptance. Second, Signs that the Alaska legislature may be working toward a deal, but what happens if they don't? And third, are we headed to just another Groundhog Day for the PFD? And now, let's join Michael. Do you want to you want to start off cracking on a little bit about what I've been chatting about all morning here with the white paper? How, how do you want to break this down into your weekly top three? Well, I think I think the university is a good good place to start, uh, and that white paper is definitely a, an important an important read for everybody who hasn't been keeping up with the, with the university situation or even those that, that even for those that have, um, the university, basically, I mean, the basic story is this. over the last however many years, since we started, you know, developing additional universities, we've built up a uni- university system we can, we can no longer afford. And the question now is now that we finally admit that we can no longer afford the universe, university system, what type of university system do we want? Uh, I think President Johnson, I I criticize him a lot. I'll even criticize him while I'm talking about it here. But I think he's done one thing that's good. I think he's I think he has laid out the options, done a good job laying out the options uh, before the Board of Regents about where we go from here. Now, he always he always caveats that with I wish we weren't here. We shouldn't be here. We can't. We 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 we're destroying the university system, um, and all of those caveats I think are are a waste of time and and wrong to one degree or another. But but once you get through those caveats, I think he's done a good job laying out laying out the alternatives, and the alternatives are and you were just talking about them earlier. The alternatives are pare down each of the existing universities, the three universities, uh, pro rata basically. Uh, and tell them to go fix it on their own with the uh, with the remaining money. The second is to keep the three university system, but adopt what what he's terming the lead university system, which means that, for example, one university would take the lead on business, one would take the lead on education, one would take the lead on arts, and 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 on from there. Um, and they've already done that to some degree, sort of, when they designated UAS. Uh, Juno as the lead university on on education, and so with that model, you have UAS continuing to take the lead on education. Either UAF or UA, UAA would take the lead on business. One of them, UAF or UAA, would take the lead on engineering, and you go and you go on from there. That's the second model. The third model uh, is the is is a model that, frankly, I think is the right model. Uh, a model that uh, Gloria O'Neill, one of the regents of the university, has sort of has sort of kept talking about uh, during the meetings the regents have been ha- uh, during the meetings the regents have been having, and I hope she continues to talk about it. And frankly, I think I think people who are trying to parse between the lines see this third model also as the as the proposal that uh, that President Johnson is is uh, is advocating. And, and, and that model is to come down to one university um, with with multiple campuses, but come down to one university, a single university, a single accredited institution, um, and and run it as a single as a single university as opposed to a university system with three separate universities uh, uh, falling inside it. That, I think, frankly, is is the model that we would have developed 
had we had we had these these revenue constraints all along right uh it's the model that that fits the size of revenue that we can afford to give the university now and, and i think it's the most efficient model so uh those are the three proposals they they the, the white paper really backs up why we need to get to those three proposals and of those three proposals, when you read through the white paper and you listen to the other things that are being said, I think that third model uh, of a single university um, uh, pairing down to a single university with multiple campuses, but a single university, I think is 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 where we should be headed. And frankly, I think it's where we will be headed once people sort of get through their minds. Uh, uh, all of the economics and all of the considerations involved. One of the things that I think that this paper does an admirable job of is talking about the duplicative effort specifically and how the fact that essentially the two campuses, the two main campuses, UAF and UAA, are competing with one another for students, all the meanwhile seeing their graduation rates drop, their enrollment rates drop, and everything else. And it it really has become a, a fight over the last bone in the yard uh, instead of, you know, it's it's the specialized or die model, right? I mean, that's kind of been the, the generalized rule over years as you look at these kind of things, you know, from business standpoints and everything else. You, you know, a lot of times you've got to specialize or you die, and that's what we've got here. Instead, the one of the suggestions is, you know, moving the engineering uh, program exclusively to Fairbanks, moving the, the, uh, the teaching program exclusively to Fairbanks, taking the arts and some of the other programs and moving them exclusively to UAA and segregating them out instead of competing for all these dollars and essentially competing with themselves and just demanding more and more money out of the system to do so. Yeah, but that's that that is really I mean that concept is still so, sort of part of the second concept, right, of of the lead university. Uh, and the problem with the lead university and, and one small area that I disagree with the uh, with the white paper on comes into play here. The white paper sort of lets UAS off the hook. They talk about how UAA and UAF duplicate each other, but UAS is part of this as well. And the, the problem with the problem with this lead university and keeping the three separate universities um, is that you still have a system wide that's trying to coordinate and trying to to lead this three university system. So you have you continue to have the the bureaucracy and the administrative efforts going on at system wide. And then you have you have the same sort of thing on a on a smaller basis being duplicated at the three separate universities. Now I know one of the proposals that 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 the UAA faculty senate has proposed is to wipe out system wide. Uh, but then you've really got you got three separate universities that have each their own bureaucracies and they're each trying to you know maximize yourself. And I think that's just I think that's a recipe for disaster. So if we're going to keep three separate universities, we need somebody coordinating it and, and saying you are the lead on this. Uh, don't duplicate what somebody else is doing. But that's just that's just that's just continuing to create this bureaucracy. I think getting down to a single university where we would have been had we focused on these revenue limitations, had we focused on 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 our fiscal limitations early on. I think getting down to a single university with one set of leadership. Uh, multiple campuses, but one set of leadership, uh, I think is the right way to go. You were talking earlier on the last segment about Washington State, how Washington State University does it. Right. That's exact. That's exactly how they do it. And I think that's the model that, that we need to be moving to. Uh, you know, of course, the other great thing is it, it did take a crack at some of the uh, misconceptions that have been pushed out there, including uh, some of the uh, research grant funding and some of the other things. They they really didn't get into the land grant. They got into it a little bit in the white paper, but they didn't really extrapolate on that. I think that, you know, the university being one of the few really huge land grant colleges in the in the United States, they could have extrapolated that out a little more. But there's lots of options here on the table. And I think for anybody out there that's trying to make this argument or at least have a conversation about it uh, and is intellectually honest this 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 paper makes some valid points as to why the university has needed to reduce its size for quite some time yeah it's yeah i think the regents are waking up to it i mean we were talking a week ago when we were talking about the university that the regents had had passed on the decision to 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 declare financial exig exigency um because they thought you know they just wanted to they wanted to put it off um, and I and and then they did it. Uh, they finally did it Monday or Monday of this week. Um, and and really, and I think they're waking up to the situation. But we're we're asking, you know, we're asking a, a lot of people to collapse into a very short period of time 
a learning process that should have been going on at least since uh, 2012, and in the case of the university, at least since the Fisher report that came out in 2011. And and you know some of us have been have been absorbing this during the during this entire period. We're sort of ready for this discussion. There are a lot of others who who haven't, who sort of lived in the fantasy world that oil was going to recover, or we just take the PFD when the time came, and we'd continue the, the party at at the P, at, 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 on PFD money, um, and 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 so it, those people who lived in that fantasy world are sort of trying to collapse all their thinking into a into a very short period of time. I will commend again. I will commend President Johnson for 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 being prepared with these three options, with sort of getting it narrowed down and getting it in front of the regents, um, for, for being prepared to do that uh, when crunch time came. I just wish he had started it. I wish this entire state had started this discussion much, much, much earlier. We wouldn't be collapsing it down. But but now we are. We're collapsing it down into a very short period. I think President Johnson's laid out good options. The regents need to catch up to it, and just like – just like they finally got on board with the Declaration of Financial Ex Exigency, they need to get on board with the concept of coming to a single university. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Uh, I mean, this is exactly it, Brad. Although I did have to laugh at the article in the ADN where it's, stoke, it's specifically talked about two of the three options that you just laid out there. Uh, and, of course, the first one was just the system-wide cuts across the board, keeping the three separate entities. And, of course, the final sentence in that in that in that paragraph was the chancellors of the three universities appear to support this option. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Thank you, Captain Obvious. I mean, you know, we'd like to continue on the gravy train that we're on right now. So, yeah, no, I mean, this this whole thing is is now getting the press that I think it deserves uh in in some in some respects and i think now uh those of us who have been kind of fighting against this have a lot of the ammunition that we need to try and go forward and kind of you know thrust this argument you know into the limelight with the correct numbers and and the backing of all the things that we've been talking about yep yep i, I think it's a great paper uh, so that leads us on to uh, the two, two and three of your weekly top three. We've got the you know reverse sweep. I know you wanted to talk about, and I know you wanted to talk about HB two thousand and one. So I'll let you guide where you want to go here. Well, let's let's talk about let's talk about the the, the total situation uh, sort of first, and and it's evolving. I mean, sort it's sort of like the sort of like the regents, right? I mean, we've seen the regents go from from denial to to, to shock and awe, or maybe it was shock and awe first, and then denial, and now finally to to acceptance uh, in a fairly short period of time, and and they're getting on with with making the decision about where the university goes from here, as opposed to fighting uh, about it, um, and and the legislature is beginning to do that as well. There was a a, a very encouraging sign yesterday when when the House didn't have a floor session, I mean the expectation was they passed. 2001, and we'll get into the details of that, but they passed 2001, House Finance passed 2001 on Monday. The expectation was that they were going to have a floor vote on Tuesday and essentially send back up to the governor most of the budget that the governor had already vetoed and just sort of continue this cycle of, of, of the denial the legislature was in. They didn't have a, a floor session yesterday. They didn't vote on 2001. And in James Brooks' article this morning in the ADN, uh, he describes how instead uh, they had a day of, of meetings uh, involving both the majority and the minority uh, and, and, and some progress, uh, according, to the, according to the quotes that James has in the article, some progress uh, toward finding uh, a solution uh, to this situation. What we've been engaged in up, in this, uh, up to this point is what uh, bankruptcy lawyers uh, call a cram down. In a bankruptcy, uh, you get all the creditors together. You need a certain amount of creditors to decide uh, how the how the remains of the or how the bankruptcy is going to go, how the how the structure is going to go. Um, you have minority creditors uh, who aren't in the majority, and and when you get a certain percentage, the bankruptcy court can can essentially do a cram down and say, yeah, we know you minority creditors don't like this deal. We know you're not getting paid what you want. You know, we know that you think that others are that you're being mistreated, but we have enough, uh, we have a super majority and we have enough to cram down the, the, uh, uh, the plan on, on you and go forward. 
that's that's sort of what the what the majorities on both the Senate side and the and the House side have been doing up to this point. They've been trying to do sort of the legislative version of a cram down of of you know passing what the what the majority can pass um, and 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 sort of ignoring the minority, cramming it down on the minority, and sending it up to the governor. There there are two things that that have stopped that. One, the governor isn't playing along, unlike our last governor. Uh, this governor has has certain principles, and he said, "No, I'm going I'm going to veto these things and send it back to you uh, uh, for doers." Two, in the case of the CBR, uh, the, the minority has a role to play. The minority has to get votes in order for draws to occur uh, from the constitutional budget reserve. So those two things have really stopped the down. Not not that the majority wasn't con- trying to continue to do it. Uh, they certainly did it with the capital budget. Uh, and they've been trying to do it with uh, with with two, or they had been preparing to do it with 2001 with the PFD bill, and and putting all the operating budget uh, uh, expenditures back in it. Um, but but yesterday seems to have seems to indicate that we may be in a pause where there are negotiations now going on between the majority and the minority uh, in an effort to reach reach a deal. And that's that's frankly a very a very positive effect. Again. Just like the regents on the on the university side, uh, we're trying to cram, we're trying to, to 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 collapse what should have been a process going on since 2012 uh, into a very short period. Right. And just like just like on the regents side, uh, there's been a lot of of, of denial about uh, a lot of a lot of, of, of rejection and a lot of denial about doing that. But tomorrow may indicate or yesterday may indicate that just like on the regent side, we're finally coming to some sort of reality on budget issues. Well, that intransigency, you know, is, is really shown that again, the, the inflexibility of the, of the majority to want to even talk about that has made it very difficult. And I think, I think you're right. You may be seeing some of the first cracks in that wall of understanding and, uh, and, and also understanding the minority at this point is not going to budge. I mean, they've been forced through every kind of pressure point that they could possibly be forced through. And now it looks like they might finally uh, actually be, uh, you know, they might actually be making some headway on that and, and forcing some cracks on the other side. I, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed. We'll see, uh, we'll see about that. I mean, what are your thoughts here? I mean, I think the minority is really holding as strong as they have has been a big factor in basically making the majority take a hard look at what's going on and realize that if something doesn't break, you know, so it's maybe making them have to take that look in the mirror and say, maybe we don't have all the money we think that we have and we should be listening to what's going on. Yeah, I think that's right, Michael. The, the one fear I have or the one fear I've had is, is was frankly in the um, in the CBR vote that occurred. I'm, I'm losing track of my days. It occurred Monday. Uh, uh, in the in the legislature, uh, when the House voted on whether to draw uh, draw from the CBR, and that vote was what twenty nine to seven. Right. It was it was one vote short of of giving the the majority the thirty votes they needed to to pass the CBR uh, 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 access to the CBR as part of the capital budget, um, and and frankly. Uh, pass uh, access to the CBR as part of the as part of the reverse sweep um, and and if that vote had gone in favor of the majority I'm not sure we would be at the negotiation stage at this point uh, I think the majority would have said great the cram downs work now on uh, you know unleashing all the Twitter uh, the people out there on Twitter and, and elsewhere to pressure uh, the Republican legislators has worked we've got to 30. Um, and we're going to keep on going here uh, with uh, with trying to cram down our version of, of what the budget would do. We're going to send it to the governor. Governor's going to veto it, but then we're going to unleash the, the the hounds again uh, when we have the the uh, the veto override uh, uh, vote. That was I think that was a critical moment. Not getting to thirty, preventing them from getting to thirty, uh, was a critical moment and and contributes to. Uh, the discussions that that may now be going on, if they'd gotten to 30, I don't think we would be I don't think we'd be taking this pause and uh, and seeing if uh, if they can find a a reasonable middle ground uh, on these issues. I was very I'm I was and I remain very concerned about those legislators, those Republican legislators who were who are part of the minority, 
but moved over and voted with the majority uh, on on the CBR draw vote. Um, I don't think they did anybody a service. The, the the ones who moved over, I don't think did anybody a service uh, well, in this process. Well, let's talk about that for a second because I analyzed that a little bit yesterday uh, because, I mean, we could see it. And, you know, the, the one that stood out, of course, to begin with was Kelly Merrick. Um, but it, it, to me, that wasn't necessarily a surprise. Again, looking at the politics of the situation. Uh, now, a quick reminder: Kelly Merrick is married to uh, to a union uh, executive. She had a lot of union support in her uh, in her campaign, but your construction union and things like that, uh, you know, pushing behind her. It was one of my concerns about her as a candidate. She seems to have stayed strong uh, throughout this whole process. But I was wondering, you know, this could have been kind of like a gimme in, in, in my mind when I looked at it. If she did the math and realized that she would be one of the only ones that would cross over to vote on this, she still knew it was safe and she could then go back to her constituency and say, see, I voted for it. Uh, while knowing that it was a safe, essentially a safe vote to do so, uh, do you? I mean, do, do you see the same thing, or am I am I wishful thinking it here? No, I, I Merrick, Merrick was always has always been sort of the, the the one that you really wonder about because of that relationship with uh, with Joy. Uh, the ones I really, the, the ones I really have have are not am not comfortable with. Are Rasmussen, Laddie Shaw, and Josh Revac. Right. Uh, they're the. I mean, Kelly sort of has that that family relationship that that always made you a little uh, a little skittish. But th- those three have been have been hardcore members of the minority. Now each of them are going to say, well, in my district there was all this you know pressure for a capital budget, and and Sarah Sarah Rasmussen when she got on the floor said, you know, I wish I wasn't in this situation. Uh, I don't think this is the right thing to do, but you know the capital budget. Well, it turns out uh, that we weren't that we aren't up against a deadline on the capital budget. Uh, the Department of Transportation had had issued press releases, not picked up in the press, but 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 certainly at least the members of the legislature knew about them. Press releases saying the very th- very same thing that was finally in the press yesterday, which is that we weren't up against a deadline on the capital budget. Right. They didn't uh, turn into pumpkins on the 31st of July. Right. Right. And so it's and, and so those mem- the, Revac, uh, Rasmussen and Shaw, uh, their break with the minority, their move uh, to vote with the majority on the on the CBR draw, that, though, that bothers me uh, because you- if that had gone to 30, if there yeah. had been one more, if, as some say, um, uh, uh, Tallarico had been there and had voted to make it 30. Uh, or would have voted to make it 30. If that had happened, um, I don't think, I think we would be in this cycle now for another. It'd be deep, yeah. It'd be deep. But we've got uh, about uh, eight minutes here to finish up with our third item, which of course is HB 2001. Brad, you, you want to crack off on this here? Well, this is the PFD bill. And and House Finance uh, yesterday, Two days ago, House Finance. Two days ago, I'm, I'm losing track of time. I'm just disoriented. This isn't Tuesday; it's Wednesday. Right. House Finance on 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 Monday um, uh, passed 2001 that that cut the PFD down to $1,600. They would say build it up to $1,600, but but the the actual fact is cut it down to $1,600 from what the statute provides, um, and essentially put back into the operating budget. Proposed to put back into the operating budget. Uh, 75% of what the governor had uh, vetoed out, um, and 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 passed that out of high, House Finance and proposed to move it uh, to the floor. As we were just talking about in the last segment, uh, we it appears that that we're finally getting the negotiations that uh, that we need. That 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 bill did not go to the floor uh, yesterday, and and people are talking. We're we're finally taking a pause in this in this cram down effort that the that the majorities have been have been uh, been engaged in, the PFD um, I, it, it needs to be part of the discussions. Frankly, if everything else lines up, it probably needs to be part of the of the final compromise uh, uh, that's worked out uh, with respect to how we're going to go forward in financing. We can't work out the PFD in isolation and say we're going to cut it from. Uh, 50% of statutory net income down to down to where it probably will end up is which is 50% of POMV. We can't agree to do that 
if we don't have other things in in a row because we still are going to run a deficit that's not going to be enough to cover the deficit right and saying it's going to be 50 percent of the PO, pomv is just the starting point for the next round of cuts that that the legislature will want to make uh next year so it, it we need to resolve everything everything means operating budget levels that we're going to have going forward capital budget levels we're going to have going forward the reverse sweep the issues around the reverse sweep um need to resolve all those plus the pfd uh if we get those other things put together in a package then the pfd needs to be needs to be part of the package and move forward uh hopefully that's the discussions that that they're having It's it's the discussions we're going to get to at one point or another if the if the majorities continue on this cram down approach which is we're going to put all the stuff back in the operating budget we're going to reverse the revert or we're going to do the reverse sweep uh in the capital budget uh we're not going to we're not going to resolve the pfd issues we're, we're going to treat it continues an ad hoc on an ad hoc basis that's going to go up to the governor the governor's going to veto the heck out of it again it's going to come down to the legislature the vetoes are going to be upheld uh and we're going to be we're going to go back into another cycle uh of this uh so hopefully hopefully the pause that that we saw yesterday is a pause that's going to grow into a resolution of these issues. But all four of the issues, the operating budget, the reverse sweep, the capital budget, and the PFD need to be on the table. We can't just take one of those out like the PFD um, and resolve and, and, and reach a compromise on that. Uh, we can't do that because we'll still have deficits. We need to resolve it all going forward. What about this continual move, again, by the majority to continue to try and, uh, again, just re reverse and override the vetoes? I mean, you know, through one method or another, whether through straight override or, in this case, just reappropriating everything and, and all these other things. I mean, the, it, it seems like, again, just this willful blindness to say we've got to do it no matter what. We talked a few minutes ago about whether or not there's a chink in that armor. Um, do you think that some of these members are starting to realize that it's just not a continuing possibility or, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's a wear down effort, right? I mean, it's a cram down to wear them down. It, it, it's, it, the majority is, is trying to continue to cram down, uh, uh, its vision of what Alaska ought to be, including PFD cuts. Um, and frankly, it's trying to wear down the minority as we were talking about during the break, I'm concerned about th about the three members, uh, well, the four members, but we, we talked about Merrick, the, the three members, the three additional members who went over and voted with the majority on the CBR, uh, uh, the draw on the CBR as part of the part of the capital budget. Hopefully, uh, uh, that's all that that the majority gets. Hopefully, these discussions, these discussions are a recognition that they're not going to get to 30. Uh, and they're not going to be able to continue to cram down and wear down, try to wear down uh, uh, the minority members. Hopefully, in fact, if if the if if there is a rescinding vote, I mean, we've talked about it, people have talked about a third vote on the uh, on the capital budget on the CBR uh, draw, uh, uh, one one more vote that they get with rescinding, att attempting to rescind the vote they they had um, to try to get to 30 as as a part of the process to get up to 30. Hopefully, when they do that rescinding. Uh, if they do that rescinding vote, that the three members, uh, Rasmussen, Revac, and Shaw, won't be part of that effort. And if they do rescind, hopefully uh, uh, the, they will reconsider their vote and uh, and come back over to the minority side. Uh, now that we know, I mean, now that we know that the capital budget is not is not hanging by a thread if we don't get it done by July 31st, uh, hopefully they'll see that as an opportunity to, to come back over to the minority side. Um, I, I think uh, I think that we're going to get I, I think we're going to negotiate through this. I mean, just like on the university side, we're, we're 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 operating at light speed to go over a bunch of issues that we should have been discussing since 2012. But it looks like the university is sort of getting there. They're sort of getting to a recognition. They have to they have to change. Hopefully that same thing's occurring in the legislature that we're doing it at light speed. But hopefully people will understand that 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 we need to make this progress. We're going to have to get to this. Pro we're going to have to get to this point. The governor is going to continue to veto if we don't get to this point. Um, and that's just going to extend this process out. Hopefully we're beginning to get that recognition that we have to have to resolve all these issues uh, in the course of negotiations. Less than a minute, Brad. Wrap up here. What can people do? What should we be doing and paying attention to? Back 
your legislators, back the ones who are resisting the cram down, uh, back the ones who are uh, continuing to, uh, uh, to to try to change, to try to get the, the footprint of government down, back them, tell them when you think they've gone wrong. I frankly sent notes uh, uh, after the capital budget, after Rasmussen, Revac, and Shaw uh, joined with the majority. Tell them when you think they've gone wrong, but back them when they're right uh, and stay in touch with your legislators. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, thanks, Brad, for coming on board and joining us. As always, it's good, entertaining stuff, and it keeps us informed. We appreciate you coming on. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.